Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I have got a quick video for you. I've been busier than a one-legged cat trying to bury its stuff on a frozen pond. And if you can envision that happening, it's pretty busy. One-legged man in a butt kicking contest, that's been me this week. So I've got a new piece of equipment in the shop, one that I'm super excited to share with you, one that I've wanted. I've wanted a piece of equipment like this for years and I am super excited to have it. Also want to share with you the unloading footage. Me and my buddy Al got this thing off a trailer by ourselves, saved a ton of money over hiring a rigging crew to come out and set this thing off. It can be done, and you can do it yourself as well with some of the most basic tools, at least as far as I'm concerned. We're also going to compare the new machine that I got to an old machine that I've got that do the same thing but are constructed very, very differently. So, thanks for watching. Let me show you this new piece of equipment and some unloading footage. So can you tell what this thing is just by its curvy profile underneath of this blanket? Some of you, maybe. Most of you, probably not. Now I'm going to pull the cover off. We're going to count down from five. Five, four, three. You got to count with me because that's what we're doing here. Five, four, three, two, one. This is a Brown & Sharp MicroMaster 618 a very very fine specimen of a surface grinder so let me get you in a little closer show you you know around this thing i think that you will find that it is of very high quality maybe not the best machine ever made but it's a good one so check out the controls on the front of this brown and sharp micromaster very finely done look how thick about three times it's solid cast iron that's at least five eighths of an inch thick by probably an inch way heavier than it needs to be but that has a good feeling when you turn these handles also a uh, nice finish on the inside as well black crinkle coat attention to detail satin chrome on the center handle nice large dials for uh, good resolution when you are uh, you know dialing your part in adjustable dials that are very easy to adjust and lock they lock very solid as well. This is, uh, did I tell you, forward and back on the grinding wheel on this one, right to left on the table on this one, and this one here is the grinding wheel up and down. So same deal with the adjustable. Haven't cleaned it up yet, but you get the idea. And then if you lock this center knob, you can use this dial here to control down in uh, half dial increments. This is graduated in thousandths. This is your fine control graduated in half thou, but you could easily split those and do, you know, up to probably a tenth at a time if you, if you tried, but it'd be easy to split, do two and a half tenths. I mean, you get the idea. Fine control, other machine doesn't have it. These are much nicer. Let me show you the other machine and you'll see what I'm talking about. I love the, love the way that this is made. So this machine is labeled Maxo, but it looks to me to be identical castings to the Kent grinders made in Taiwan. There's nothing wrong with these machines. I don't want to say that they're not good machines because I know guys that got these and they are very, very accurate. All I want to put forward is this machine was built to a price point that was much lower than what the Brown and Sharp machine was. And there's sacrifices that are made. And one of those obviously is the handles. You know, cheap, thin plastic handles, uh, rack and pinion to move this table right and left. On the other machine, it's it's belt driven like a big uh, flat belt, cogged belt. Much nicer feel, but you know they still do the same thing. It just don't they just don't feel the same. That's all I'm trying to say. Handles or the dials kind of hard to adjust on this machine without moving stuff. It just does not have the same feel as uh, that machine that's built, probably to double the price point. So it's hard to compare these two accurately, but you get the idea. This handle's broken. They're just super thin and flexible, and they don't have the feeling that the other machine does. So if you would, pay attention to the way that this machine is designed, as far as the way that it moves anyway. So if I want to move across the grinding wheel, I've got my part on the chuck, 
let me move this out of the way so you can see. If I want to move my part across the grinding wheel, I can move this handle and it moves the entire saddle forward and back. You can see the column of this machine is stationary, not moving. Forward, right to left, forward and back. Now let me take you over to the brown and sharp and show you how it's designed. It's, it's totally different than this. So remember me showing you the other grinder, table moving right to left and forward and back. In relationship to the operator, the chuck would move away when I would traverse the grinding wheel across the part. This machine operates quite different, actually. Table obviously moves right to left, but when you traverse the wheel across the part, the whole column on this machine moves. So table is stationary other than moving right to left. The column moves up and down, or the spindle, and forward and back. And I'm not sure how they pulled off getting this thing to move as easy as it does, but it takes extremely little effort to move that entire casting you know, across the part. So I thought that is a very neat design. Not exactly for sure as to why Brown and Sharp done it that way. I'm sure they had reasoning behind it, but it is a very, very neat way to do it. So, and obviously completely different from the way the other machine's designed. Do you like that machine? I do, I think it's neat. I think it's really neat. Well, hopefully it works good. We'll have to fill it up with oil here for long and, and try it out. So speaking of oil, uh, both of these machines are hydraulic. Both are uh, automatic as far as their operation, but they are very different designs. The uh, Maxo grinder has an external hydraulic tank and pump, which I'll show you in just a second. It takes up quite a bit more floor space than uh, than this machine, although that does have a bigger uh, work envelope. It is an eight by 24, I think. Not exactly for sure, but it's a bigger machine just slightly. But even though it is a larger machine, as far as its work envelope, having that external pump and tank take up a lot more floor space than this machine that has a uh, pump and stuff built internal, 15 gallon capacity on this. And it's all kind of contained in the same in the same space. So this machine is a smaller work envelope, but still, I don't know, maybe they take up close to the same area, but I like the idea of the tank and the pump hydraulic system being internal. And uh, I'll take the cover off the front of this. I'll show you inside of it and you'll see this thing is built. It's built very, very nice. So I love looking at the designs on these machines, the way that the you know engineers came up with you know different ways to do similar things. Big cork seal on the front of this thing. Cora's trying to attack a moth. Let me show you inside of this thing. It's pretty pretty impressive. I'm in the middle of changing the oil on it. So there's your look inside of the main casting here. That casting, at least the front area, that's two inches thick. Cast iron. It's just a well-built machine. Large electric motor that runs a uh, coupler that runs a hydraulic pump down to the bottom that you can't see. Two sight glasses for your oil level. Large canister filters. There's two of them. There's one in the one in the back as well. There may be more than two, but I've seen two large canister filters. Check out that valve body, how large that is. And there's your controls on the side for the for the movement of the machine. Very, very robust, I guess you'd say. And this machine automatically oils itself. It's not reliant on the operator to pump a handle or push a button. If this machine's running and operating the way that it should, get out of there, bug. It should be it should be oiling. And that was one of the things that kept these machines alive is that they didn't rely on the operator uh, to oil. So I'm, I've got the oil out of this. It was drained out during moving. Uh, that's just a great excuse to change the oil in it because I'm sure that it needs it. But you know, just look at it. Look how thick the castings are and how heavy uh, everything is built on this. So let me show you the other machine. You know, you'll see there's a big difference between the two.
So there's a look at the oiler on the side of this machine. It's relying upon the operator. They're not all made like this, but in this machine's case, it is. So if you don't oil it manually, it doesn't get oiled. So here's a look at the hydraulic system on this machine, totally separate from the machine, hooked through a couple hoses. Nothing wrong with this. It does take up a foot, about like three feet of space, where the other machine's all kind of made in one. So, you know, different design. Serves the same purpose, but I do like the compactness of it all being made inside the base because this machine is it's hollow underneath. So it is nice that to take up that space with stuff that otherwise would be external, like, like this is. So buying a used surface grinder is always a gamble. Unless you can go physically run the machine and grind parts on it, you're taking a big chance. Because of the way that they're used and they produce all sorts of abrasive particles, they're prone to wear. It's just the way it goes. You accept that. And in this case, this, bought, this was bought at auction. It was said to be operating, but that doesn't mean that it's not wore out simply because it will move and do its thing. Looking at this machine, I am very optimistic that it's going to be okay. Uh, it's got very little visible scoring or anything like that. All the screws operate really nice, and it's got very little backlash. So I'm hoping that it's going to be good. Now, the idea here in my shop, I at the moment, got two grinders. One of them is going to be leaving. It may be this one, it may be this one, but one of them is leaving. The hope is that this machine will be at least as accurate as this one. If that's the case, the Maxo is going to head out the door and this is going to take its place. Even though it has a smaller work envelope, just the quality of the machine is so much nicer. And uh, I just like them. So that's the idea, is that this one is going to replace this one. I do need to test run this, run it through its paces, and uh, see. But I'm optimistic that it's going to be at least as good as the one that I currently have. So there we go. A brief overview of the Brown & Sharp 618 MicroMaster. It is a very nicely made machine. So buying a piece of equipment is its really only half the battle. A lot of these auction companies will, these auction sites will load the equipment on your trailer, but once you get it home, you know, it's up to you to get it off the trailer and in your shop. Me and my buddy Al have done this many times. We've never tipped a piece of equipment over. Every piece of equipment in my shop has been unloaded in a similar manner to what I'm going to show you here. And a lot of times that's a deal breaker for people. You know, how am I going to get it off the trailer once I get it home? Well, I'm going to show you how I do it with some very basic tools. And obviously you can adapt this to fit your circumstances or you know, whatever floats your boat. But it works for me. So obviously the easiest way to get a piece of equipment off of a trailer and into your shop would be to hire a rigging company to come out to your place with some heavy equipment, lift that stuff up, and set it directly in your shop. That would also be the safest way. And if you can afford to do that, that's great. But if you're like me and probably like most people, you try to save a dollar everywhere you can and do what you can on your own anytime you can. And I've always done it the way that you see here. Use a, a small 120 volt electric hoist with a chain that is hooked to a concrete anchor that's set in the floor. In fact, I have several concrete anchors set throughout the shop so I can move stuff around. But I would much rather take the money that I save on a rigging fee and put that into tooling. Tooling for the new piece of equipment that I got. So, the challenge is, that I see, is we are trying to pull it off this way. Yeah. And we're pulling it over that way. Well, we can, as long as we get it in here on the floor, it'll scoot around relatively easy. I can set anchors where I need to. And we can move that baby around anywhere we want. So even though I'm using an electric winch to pull this thing, I've do also done this with a simple Harbor Freight to come along as well. As long as you've got you know, a good anchor point, some chains and stuff, a few pieces of pipe, those are really helpful. You know, you're good. 
you can move it an inch, you can move it a mile. You just have to plan ahead and consider everything that can be considered as far as safety goes because a lot of these pieces of equipment, you know, they're not weighted towards the bottom. Some of them are you know, real top heavy. So you gotta be careful. How about we just put some more bars under it and just keep going? It's not gonna roll, it's not gonna roll forward and it's, and it's not gonna roll all the way off the trailer even if the chain broke. So one thing that I try to do is think ahead. What can happen? What does this machine likely to do if it you know, was to get off balance or anything? And try to address that way before it ever happens. We've got this machine on all four feet or lag bolted to the actual pallet and it's strapped down. We've got uh, come alongs and stuff ready to situate this thing as it's pulled off the trailer. Uh, towards the ramps. We want it to come down on the ramps at least relatively center. So we're trying to think of all of this stuff way in advance and just not rush the job. We took hours to get this thing off the trailer, but you know, we got it off the trailer without it flopping on its face or crushing the daylights out of you. So it's always a exciting time moving heavy equipment and always a huge relief when you get it off the trailer and accidents do happen but usually they happen when you get in a rush um it's it's going this way crab walking but it's not turning. How's it doing? One, not, one more time, I didn't get it. Ready? I'm ready, do it. But not. Oh, okay. Thanks. Ready? Yep. Check, Cora. Oh, we're doing it, the thing. It's uh, looking pretty looking. good. Yep, it's doing the thing. Hold on, let me let me uh, see if it'll tilt forward. You got it still attached. Yeah. <laughs> need a little more Steve into that. Here we go, bud. All right, now what? Just let off of that a little bit. Go on, Cora. Oh, 
Okay. 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 Boom. She's on the floor. So a brown and sharp, six by 18. I'm not for sure of the vintage. This thing is a lot of grinder. That is for sure. Don't know the condition other than it's old. Came out of a working shop. Yep, it did come out of a working shop. So we'll see. So it feels super good to have this thing in the shop. It is a very nice grinder. Everything feels really good on it. Everything looks pretty good. I am very optimistic that it'll that it'll be a accurate grinder, but only grinding some test blocks will tell me that. And I can't do that now, or I would. I'd love to share that with you. And I will in the future, but I still have to change the fluid in this thing, clean out the sump, clean out the filters, clean up this machine a little more, you know, do a test run on it. And if it does check out good, like I mentioned, the other one's out of here. And uh, we'll have a nice quality uh, grinder in the shop. So I've just wanted one of these forever. And uh, that's really the, the main motivation for me to try to find one. So huge thanks to my buddy Al for helping me on this. Uh, me and him have unloaded lots of equipment together. You know, it's nice to have a second set of eyes, someone that you trust. Cause doing it on your own is pretty dangerous. Uh, just somebody to be there and look at it from a different angle. Somebody to yell at you to stop when you're pulling it, whether it be with a cheap Harbor Freight come along, you know, a winch like I was using or, or whatever. Find you a good anchor point, chain the daylights out of them, strap them in a way where they just can't fall over. Or at least you tried your best to not give them anywhere to go. Uh, that's always been successful for me and hopefully gives you know, a few of you out there who question your abilities maybe to do it uh, the confidence uh, to potentially do it yourself and save a lot of money keep that money tier for yourself put it in the tooling build your shop up a little better than paying somebody to do something you know that you can do on your own safely if if you take your time and be careful so i guess that's it for this week so thanks for watching viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who has helped me out whatsoever. I am much appreciative of that. So that is it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.